but really, I think this intro is uh, as long as it's my life. It's very long, right? Like... Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think we we got it. We got it. You <laughs> like it. You you're positive. I, you you like I... you like me. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'll stop. Uh, uh, we'll send it so people can also uh, can also read it uh, themselves. So there, there's no surprise ending. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, if if anyone didn't get it, um, you're very well known, and I've been Thanks. writing a lot. Thank you. Um, and I and I kind of want to ask with start with asking you, uh, how has your day been? Oh, it's it's. Uh, I must say that you know that it's even difficult for me during these days of war to to break reality into days it I, it's like I, it's many times when i think about something i ask myself was it today or was it three days ago because i think that all those kind of uh, normal uh, uh, hints that help you kind of take the day for example i teach in university but because of the rocket uh, tech there's, there's no school in university so I don't know uh, when Wednesday is because Wednesday is my university day. So everything is blurry. But what I, did I do today? I think I did things. I, I let me see. I, 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 I gave an interview for sure because every day I give an interview. I'm so bad at it. You know that yesterday uh, I, I walk our son to school. He allows me to walk him to school even though he's 18. And so uh, I came back from walking into school and I always wear my pajamas because I write in my pajamas. So I wore my pajamas and I started writing. And then there was a knock on the door and I said, oh, my God, he forgot something. So I opened the door and in the doors was a TV crew. And I said, yes, can I help you? And they said, we're supposed to have an interview now. And I said to them, no way. And I said, yes, yes. And I said, okay, you're probably right because what what they would be doing there. So they came and there was a, a Polish crew and they, I, I was sitting in the living room and the, the interviewer said to me, you know, I will respect any decision you will take because it's in your pro prerogative, but uh, uh, relying on my experience uh, in TV, I would say that if you keep uh, your pajamas then people would look at your pajamas and won't listen to your insights. So I said, okay, that's a good point. And I changed my pajamas. So basically, you know, it's really, I think that life is kind of trying to survive what's going on, which is mostly, I think, uh, requests from soldiers or people or doing speaking engagement to uh, people from the kibbutzes in Otef Aza, uh, who were evacuated, or I don't know, going meet this, reading to soldiers, or but it, but it, it doesn't really have any criteria. I can tell you that a, a week ago, I had on Instagram a, a woman said saying that her husband was in Gaza and that she, they can't communicate, and they had a very short talk, and he told her some kind of a, a weird sentence about a crocodile. And she said, what's the sentence? He says, if you love me by the time we'll meet, you write a st short story about it. And he, he hung the phone and she contacted me and she was very stressed. And she said, I have a baby. She's crying all the time. I don't know how to write stories, but he's in Gaza. Come on, write him a story about a crocodile. So I wrote him a story about a crocodile. <laughs> So, okay, so we'll get soon to understand exactly how you, you're you so involved with, so with writing stories for people you don't know. Um, and you're very much of a, a storyteller. So um, can you say something about your first story? Do you remember when that was or the transition between storytelling and writing? Uh, yes, I, I, I wrote my first story during my compulsory army service. Uh, basically, I, I I was in a unit where we would have those very very long shifts when you we were totally isolated in this very tiny room, and those shifts would be like twenty four hours or thirty hours, and uh, it was I really 
I was very good with this because I'm very good at kind of disconnecting myself and not noticing the time passes. So I was good with that. But my best friend who brought me to this unit, uh, we were there together and he committed suicide and he shot himself and he basically died in my arms, kind of, you know, and, they, and I took him to the hospital, you know, while he was dying. And after he died, when I got back to the army, then the army said, because you're you, uh, using equipment that is very expensive, we need the, to evaluate if you're sane after the trauma you passed. So I got into this room and there was this guy, an officer, and he said, I'm a psychiatrist. You okay? And I said, I guess so. So he said, great. And he put this stamp and they said, okay, so if you're okay, please do another shift. And they put me in this tiny room. Uh, basically, uh, my friend shot himself in the temple. So the ball, bullet came from the other side. So the bullets that killed him was still in the ca wooden cabinet, you know, uh, in this little room. And the floor was very sticky because I guess the person who washed it after they found, I, we, I took him to hospital, didn't do a very good job. And the, I, it's a, on the room there was a table and there was basically a computer a, and a rifle with two magazines. And I had 30 hours to go. And I remembered some things that my father told me. My late father was a Holocaust survivor. And when I, and he survived the war by uh, staying with his parents for more than 600 days in a hole they dug in the ground. And I asked him when I was a child, how come he didn't become crazy, you know? And he said, I had this trick. He said, every day when I would be in the hole, I would imagine a word that would be exactly like the word I lived in, but I'd change one detail. For example, it was a word in which Nazis were looking for Jews, but when they found them, they gave them chocolates. And then I would live for one day in this world, you know, the Wehrmacht would run after me with chocolates and I would say, no, I can't take it anymore. And they say, come on, you Jew, eat another chocolate. And then the day would finish, I go to sleep and I would wake up the next day and I say, okay, this is a word where Nazis are murderers, but they only kill beautiful red-headed girls. And I have one in my village, but I hide her in my attic and I fool them and she falls in love with me and we get married and we have many red-headed kids. And then I would, every day I would pick another place. And when I was a child, I said to him, but father, when you'd finish telling yourself this story, you would still be in the same hall with Nazis above you, with your sister dead. What's the point? And my father said, when you feel that you're in a very confined space, you need uh, to widen it. If you can do it physically, you do it. But if you can't, you do it in your mind. And the moment that you imagine something, it's an option. So even if it's not, re it doesn't exist, it exists more than something that you didn't think about. And I think that when I was a child, I didn't totally understand what my father was talking about. But, but when I was in this room, having to spend all this time, with the sticky floor and the bullet in the cabinet and the rifle on the table. I said, yeah, you know, I should do what my dad, dad would have done. This is a very small space and I should widen it, you know? And I basically sat down and uh, I wrote the, the first story I've ever written in my life. Which one was that? Pipes. So you, we, we prepared a... Uh... I think we prepared. Do you have that that story with you? I think. Uh, uh, I I I don't have pipes, but I have the story have from the from cover the... of pipes. Yeah, it's a, this is a short text. Uh, by the so, way, I I can say officially that I don't tell the story I told you in, in, when I do zooms or events. I usually don't tell it, and I don't know why I told you. I have something more kind of polite and. And uh, I guess this means that I like you. Uh, okay. It's, it's, it's the TSP effect. 
<laughs> it's a good crowd. And I do want to ask, maybe before you read the story, because yeah. the whole premise of what you just said, I mean, it's really tough stories. I can understand why you yeah. think these aren't the ones you open with. And yet within them, uh, it seems that there's imagination and that there's humor uh, and hope. Can you say a little more about maybe where that comes from? I mean, you mentioned your father. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's. I, I think. I think that uh, my parents were both uh, uh, children of war. You know, they passed the Holocaust very young, and I think that uh, my mother was orphaned in a very early age. So, so the feeling that we had growing up wasn't very much this feeling of growing up with a, a, a parents that are very, very kind of stressed and keep to the rules and do it everything it was just a growing up with wild children that grew up to be wild people that are hungry for life and that are kind of fearless and that they don't take into consideration you know a uh, bureaucracies or what the neighbors would say and i often say that i didn't uh, grow up in a family uh, but i grew up in a in a partisan group uh, hiding in the forests of ramad gam because the the entire energy that, that we had in our home was really that uh, we create a story, we decide what's important. And and it came from the fact that that uh, uh, my parents, especially my mother, as, as a child, she lived in a world where she couldn't rely on anyone. So, for example, so the grown-ups that she knew would either try to rape her or kill her or take her clothes uh, or blankets and, you know, so, so the idea was that that you have to go very, very deep, and if you feel that something is right, you go with it, even if everybody says that you're crazy. And, and you know, just for an example, my father, uh, he would change profession every seven years, because he said that after uh, surviving the war, he he didn't want to live one life; he wanted to live many lives. And he wanted to live a life in which he's good at his job. And he wanted to live a life in which he's bad at his job. And he wanted to live a life when he makes a lot of money. And he wanted to live a life where he's poor. And he made a point of changing his profession. And really, it, it was a, a legitimate a question in our home to ask, a, Dad, are we poor? Are we still poor? Are we rich now? And... Sometimes my dad would do stuff that he was good at, and sometimes he was. He said, oh, no, 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 we're not poor anymore. We're actually, we're very rich. What do you want? Uh, you want to go to London? You know, or, or yes, we're kind of poor now, so maybe we wait another year because I'm going to change profession. I hope I'll do better or something else. So this kind of a, a freedom was something that was always kind of a, presented to us as a, as a value, this idea that you make your decisions not because... A, the system wants you to, but because you wanted to. And on the 7th of October, I remembered one thing that my mom always said. My mom said to me, when things are stable, lean on anything you want. Lean on a tree, lean on a car, lean on a fence. But she said, the moment things start shaking, lean only on yourself. And I really felt that, you know, that when everything was into kind of running to Facebook, running to the TV, running to all those places that are supposed to kind of make sense out of reality. I thought about my mom and I said, you know, I'm going to find my answer, but I'm going to go from inside out. You know, I'm not going to ask the word to enlighten me. I'm going to ask my question, make my roots to find them. And I think that many advisors that... My parents gave me it what didn't really seem like advice at the time, but more the way that they deal with their history kind of become relevant these days. You know, suddenly they, I, I find myself remembering many things they told me. Hmm. Um, I'm just thinking of, of, of where, where, where to go now. Maybe, yes, if you can read the story. So we hear kind I, of. One of one of your pieces, and then we'll uh, go. For yeah, it. yeah. I, I, so I can say in advance that it's the shortest uh, piece I ever written, and the reason that it, that it, it's short because it appeared as a back cover text, and the story behind it is that be, I basically I grew up in a, in a town outside of Tel Aviv, but 
the distance isn't that big, but it's a little bit like New Jersey to New York. I grew up in Ramat Gan, so I didn't know any artists. I didn't know how artists live. I read a lot of books. Uh, and when my book was supposed to come out, they, they, they explained to me from the publishing house that they have a back cover text. And when they showed me the back cover text, it seemed very pompous. You know, I remember they had a sentence saying uh, a new voice in Israeli literature. And I said to them, look, I tried to do something very specific. What, what is this new voice in Israeli literature? And the guy said to me, look, first three books, your new voice. On the uh, fourth one, I'm going to make you a pillar in Israeli literature. And I said to him, but, and he says, no buts. You know, you have to, you have to uh, bite the bullet for the first three books and then I'll make you a pillar. It's a promise. And I said to him, but I don't want to be a pillar. And then at some stage they said, you know what? We don't understand what you want. Your book, nobody's going to read it anyway. So you want, you write the by cover text, but it has to be very, very short. And uh, uh, I had to write it pretty quickly. And it was a uh, uh, Hanukkah night. And uh, I made myself a menorah out of plastic toys. So I, before writing the text, I thought I lit a candle, you know. And uh, so I lit the candle and the candle was lit and I was very happy about it. And then the, the menorah was lit and I was more ambiguous. And then the, the table caught fire and I realized that this wasn't a good move, but uh, I took a, a water bucket and I put put down this little fire and I inhaled a lot of uh, smoke. So I quickly found myself in an ER. And in the ER, the doctor that came to greet me was a very friendly, handsome doctor. He looked a little bit like George Clooney and he was very, very friendly. Some may say too friendly. And the other time he would he called me Chabub, which I would say in English is mate or something or more, more like mate or darling, something in between. Darling, yeah. Or yeah. And he would touch me a lot, which was very reassuring. But but in a like in a like you know, like in a very old time male way, kind of hitting me on the shoulder and all those kind of things that you know cool the people from older generation do. And he, when I came, he said to me, tell me what happened. And then I said to him, out of plastic. And then he, he hit me on the shoulder and he said, darling, you don't have to tell me everything. Tell me just what the important stuff. And I said to him, I can't breathe. And he said, all right, that was easy. Okay, come on. And he was very happy. And they, he put me, uh, gave me the simulation mask and he took care of me. And, they, and he didn't leave my bed until my pulse was stable. But the moment my pulse was stable, he left my bed and went to condense other patients in the ER. And he left his uh, prescription notebook. And I wrote on it this very short text that became the back cover text uh, of my book. But it was I wrote it in the ER. And it goes like this. When you have an asthma attack, you can't breathe. When you can't breathe, you can hardly talk. To make a sentence, all you get is the air in your lungs, which isn't much. Three to six words, if that. You learn the value of words. You rummage through the jumble in your head. Choose the crucial ones. And those cost you too. Let healthy people toss out whatever comes to mind the way you throw out the garbage. When an asthmatic says, I love you, and when an asthmatic says, I love you madly, there's a difference. The difference of a word. And the word is a lot. It could be stop or inhaler. It could even be ambulance. Thank you. I will say that that's the first story by you I've ever read. And uh, the reason... You suffer I... from asthma? No, it's a story I read and it made me immediately think of uh, Tehila by Agnon and the story that he says about how, she, you know, the numbered words that we have in our lives. Um, so, uh, it... so, you know, so I once, because of Tehila of Agnon, 
I, I have a newsletter, you know, a, and in the newsletter, alphabet soup, alphabet soup. So, so I write there, I have this a section called alternative fan facts, where I invent facts that are not true. So one of the places of the things that I invented was the Moso Mesopotamian hell, which is a place where you die. A, basically, you live forever, but you can use every word once. So you can say yes once or no once or love once or please once, but then you can't. And the story is that the people who live in there they they really is a very stingy about the words and in the end you know like i don't know you stuck with your loved one you know in a room and he says i love you and you say plumber emancipation but you try to say it kind of as if he'll feel your your love for him through the way that you say uh, i don't know a uh, heart attack heart attack you know so so it's, I think, about the same idea, about the idea that, that words are precious. Um, so I'll ask this. That was your first story. Um, and since ma many, many stories and years later, um, do you find your success uh, changed the way you write? Or is it liberating? Is it uh, limiting? How does it feel now, all these years later? Well, I think that, you know, I think that success is a very relative term. I think that, you know, when I have many writer friends and I think that uh, for most of them, they really have this kind of a moment in their uh, career that they exploded. They wrote this novel, they won the Pulitzer, they, I don't know, they, or the Booker Award or something. And with me, I've been publishing for more than 30 years. And the, I I don't think there was any kind of a specially high point or low point. I don't even have a favorite book. You know, when I meet people and I ask them, which one of my books do you like the most? Then each of them picks the book, I don't know, that he liked the most. But I write story collections. I don't write novels. So so every person kind of has a... There, there is something about, let's say, the my career... I wouldn't say it's a plateau. I think it goes in many directions, but uh, but if the but if there are changes, is that I work in different mediums. I make films, and then I do, 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 do theater, and then I I don't know. I take shoot a video dance, but but in essence, I never felt that you know that I was I reached this place where I don't know. I have a a bodyguard and a house with a swimming pool. You know, I I. I all the time do the same stuff. I think that the uh, that that the most important for me uh, thing for me in uh, in writing. Uh, I'm I'm not saying in the process, but I'm saying when I publish, the most uh, the things that I I really I'm happy when I'm getting is when I get this sensation of uh, empathy and love from people, and this is something that. Uh, you know, it's it's really it's you get it or you don't get it. It doesn't matter if you sell two thousand copies of your book or if you sell two million copies copies of your book. In the end, it's this uh, man that comes to you in the street and stutters something or an email that you get. You know, these are the things that you consider as a success. Um. So, when when you write uh, a story. Does it come out and it's the first thing that comes out and it's done? Or do you rewrite, rewrite and rewrite? Can you say a little bit about your process? Because they are very short. It's not like yeah. it's a process than writing a novel, for instance. So there is something about, about the way that I write is that uh, uh, there's something about, let's say, the drive of writing that it it's always comes from some kind of a curiosity. It's kind of, I write a story because I want to know what's going to happen next, you know? And and I think that, there is, that this kind of writing, you know, uh, you, it has advantages and disadvantages. I think that the for me, the greatest advantage which makes me stick with it, it's really that it's the most fun way to read, you know? And one could argue that it's really the difference between, let's say, 
uh, me telling you an adventure that I had against me going with you to an adventure. So let's say when I write a story, when I write a funny sentence, I laugh when I write it because I just figured out it's funny. When somebody dies, I cry when I write it because I just figured out. So it's a different relationship. It's, it's as if like I'm a reader of my story and I realize that if I won't write the next sentence, I won't know what's happening. You know, it's like a, in cartoons, they have sometimes the character walks over a cliff, but he holds a pencil. So he keeps uh, drawing the ground so it doesn't fall. So I think that this is this is really the feelings the feelings that I have, and I think that when you write in such ways, and basically uh, the process is finding a way to lose control over the story, and then there there could be a lot of editing to do because uh, because you are all over the place many times. When I usually when I edit stories, they can be like I don't know. A third of the length of what I f- first wrote because I the story goes somewhere and then returns and it goes somewhere and then returns and looks for that you know so so it takes a lot of uh, of editing and changing and it's always for me like the this wonder that I sit down with something and something else comes up you know since the seventh of October I didn't have a chance I didn't I didn't have the ability to write. But the first story that I wrote, there was great comfort in it because because basically my sister, she's an ultra-Orthodox. She has 11 children and more than 50 grandchildren. She's 60. Uh, and more than, more than 50 grandchildren means that she thinks that it's a... It's a... It's a... Einara, it's a bad luck to count over 50. But I think there are about 60 already. And, uh, and I talked to her during the war and, uh, and she's a chassid, she's a breast silver. And I felt that if somebody would listen to her talk, she would say all those kind of optimistic, wonderful things. And I would argue with her and I say, no, 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 no. There's war. <laughs> They're killing us. It's horrible. People hate each other. And she would kind of talk. And it was almost an argument. Now, me and my sister, we never argue. But it almost became an argument. And after the talk, I sat down and wrote a story about a, an ultra-Orthodox person. And I, when I finished the story, I, look, I read the story and I thought to myself that what I was trying to tell myself through the story is leave your sister alone. You know, why do you fight with her over the fact that she's hopeful? You know, why do you want to prove to her that there is no base for happiness? You know, why are you doing it? And and with me, many times I'm kind of a, I'm life dumb, dumb, but story smart. You know, I don't know what to do in real life, but when I write a story and it gives me good advice, then I know to take it. Um, so we're going to take all of that and kind of land in today, even though I think it, it, it's popping out from uh, everywhere. Um, so... Um, and you did mention kind of the need or desire to be communicative, to have that relationship with your readers. So can you say a little bit about what you have been doing as an author since the seventh um, and maybe choose a um, couple of uh, specifics or, or stories that you'd like to share? So, so since the seventh, basically, again, I think that what happened in Israel is that Every person that you saw was trying to help and volunteering, you know. Many people were driving soldiers to the front. Other people were uh, cooking food, you know, for soldiers or helping with other things. And and I must say that this was a time where I realized uh, how, how few are the life skills that I have, you know. I I can't drive. And I can, I, I'm a horrible driver. I can't cook. You know, I'm very bad at folding things, you know. So basically, I wa- I really wanted to volunteer, but I didn't know what to do. And then very quickly, I realized that uh, a lot of uh, the people who survived the massacres were evacuated to hotels. And basically, me and my wife, who Shira Geffen, who's also a writing writer and a children book writer, and I'm also a children book writer, uh, we could come and read to the children or read to the adults or meet them. And we started going around 
And basically it wasn't really like going to normal readings because people are not in it. So we could do a reading to children and after 10 minutes, see that they're restless. So we do yoga for children or we could read for children in an event and then suddenly see that the children are captivated, but the parents with them are crying. You know, it's, 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 it, it's really, and if I can tell a, a funny story, I, I gave this this reading to people, uh, basically, you know, survivors, and many of them were elderly people. And when I finished the, the reading, there were questions, and they asked me about my writing, and then, and then we said goodbye, and everybody clapped, and they were beginning to leave. And there was this one woman that left, was staying in her seat, while others were already outside of the hall. And then she said, but you didn't tell us what to do. And I said to her, what? And she said, well, you know, you read us your story, which were very nice, but you didn't tell us what we're supposed to do now. There is war and, and everything is crazy. And you didn't tell us what we're supposed to do. And then a guy that was in the opening, he shouted, Clara, Clara, come back. He's telling what we're supposed to do. And then all the people who left the hall came, you know, some of them with the walkers and, and they sat down uh, and I was supposed to tell them what they're supposed to do. And because I'm so such a stressful and easily intimidated, very talkative person, then apparently I don't know what I said, but apparently I did tell them what they're supposed to do. And they were very happy about my answer. I don't know exactly what I said. I, I probably spoke about Now I want to know what to do. <laughs> In the end, you call me back. It's I have to leave and you have to call me back. And then, so, so I'm saying that everything was very chaotic. But, but what really happens is that in those meetings, you meet people. And, and sometimes there are people that you connect with. And you have this kind of intimacy. And you really have this kind of feeling that everybody feels lost and everybody has a question that he needs an answer. I can tell you in one of the readings, one of the, there was a woman who waited and after that she came to me and she said to me, and you know, and it's funny because you know, I'm I'm just a guy who writes stories, but you know, but I, she wanted to talk to with somebody who wasn't from her kibbutz. So she said to me that in her kibbutz there was a there was a, a Palestinian from Gaza that uh, worked for them and they became friends and they helped his family because there were some medical issues and and they were very, very close and he would come on weekends and with his children and they would play and stuff. And after the attack, they, they was meeting in the kibbutz and they said that they found among uh, the, the Hamas terrorists that they had maps exactly saying uh, who lives in which room, who has weapon where there are babies and they said they tried to figure out who made this map because it, they were like suspects you know a few people that could have done it and she said that she when they asked who could do it she she didn't say the name of their friend and she said i didn't say it because i know him and i know there's no way he could have done it but she said, but at the same time, I'm in the kibbutz and there were people who died and I feel responsible for them. And if I got it wrong and it is this man, then I'm basically neglecting my community. And she said, I don't know what to do. You know, I don't know what to do. And and I think that, uh, that this, this place where you basically go to places and you don't have any proficiency except for the fact that you can listen and that you didn't go through the hell that those people had went through. So they can look at you and see some kind of a, a normal, a confused humanity. You know, you become kind of a presenter of humanity. You say, here I am, thinking silly thoughts like you used to think before what you've been through. And and I think that when I went through those places, I, I started the, I, to have some kind of specific relationship with people that are, and also all kinds of uh, soldiers been calling me and asking me all kinds of the strangest requests and families that lost uh, their children. They ask me to help them think of how to commemorate their memory. And and basically, and it's all, 
most of those things are things that I really don't know how to do, but but it became so natural, you know, in these circumstances to do it. But the things that I did that I'm really, really happy about is that whenever I would meet somebody who would look not in not in his best time and he would tell me a, a, that he likes my stories, I would say, would you want me to send you a, a story every weekend? And they said, yes. So I would, I have this kind of WhatsApp. Uh, it already became two clubs because in one of them, I know that there are a few people that are religious. So I know that they can't put stories that are, and there is the more kind of a secular liberal uh, group. And every Friday I send them a story. Now those stories that, that are stories you already wrote or are you writing new stories for them? So I share with them also new stories, but I, basically I share with them unpublished stories because basically, uh, because my, so here's the thing. I, I, I have a new book and the idea was that uh, on the 7th, no on the 7th, on the 8th of October, I was supposed to give it to my publisher after reading and because I always neglect things, I, I said I'm going to read it on the 7th of October and then I'm going to send it and then they're going to publish it. And of course, I haven't read it since the 7th of October, you know, so the book had been delayed, but but I can st I still send those unedited stories to to people who want stories. Amazing. And there's one story which you told me about that turned... Uh received another uh kind of leg of life or uh ah yeah know, yeah oh wow oh, maybe totally... you can tell a bit about that story and yeah and you read it yeah. for us yes ah, ah oh this one i thought about another one okay i thought about about the i, I told you about the one the officers that that asked me uh, to call his uh, ex-girlfriend if he dies yes uh, so okay, but uh, we can we can do we can do both. Uh, it's really interesting. No, no, no. It's 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 um it's a very strange situation. I think right now also when when all the stories are so difficult. I mean, even a I mean, it's it's um uh, it's a difficult thing to carry, and you're providing stories to people at a very difficult time. Is it something that you're aware of and trying to also put in hope or humor, or are you just putting that aside and giving stories as they are? No, I, I think I think usually when I I choose a story, I think that there is something in the in the vibe of the story that I've I think is kind of relevant. You know, it's that it's not always uplifting. It could be depressing, but at least. It's, maybe but truthful and uh, and the thing is that that with me there is something about stories that stories were always a buffer between me and life that, i mean on the one hand they were there to help me connect to life but on the other hand they were all also like kind of an airbag in a car you know protecting me from life you're saying so you were like from an early age Yes, I think I I think that there was something about storytelling, and especially you know when I was in the army, that when I was in in a place that was unpleasant, I wanted to be in another place, like my father in the hall. I wanted to be in another world, and stories always gave me this word. You know, I was a, an avid reader, and the moment I wrote, I think that this word became the word of the stories that I wrote. So for me, the thought of a of sharing a story is kind of a is kind of giving you some kind of protection or some kind of support or comfort because because this was the function of stories in my life or in my biography you know so can you tell us a, uh, about this story with uh, yeah you wrote for noah let's go with that one uh, uh, yeah, I got so so the, the, this this story is basically I I met this amazing teenage girl from one of those kibbutzes that got massacred and 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 uh, we talked a lot and basically uh, because I thought about her a lot I 
and you know I she was she was very talented and I offered her do her a whatsapp a creative writing workshop or you know so we were in touch kind of and and she lost her father she lost her best friend and and I I, I sent her a whatsapp and I wrote something because usually when I write whatsapp I don't know what I'm writing and uh, and then later she told me that she read this whatsapp uh, in her father's funeral. And the, the moment when she said that, I realized it was a text, you know, because I treated it some kind of a message, you know, but but I realized it was a text. So so I, I read you this text. Uh, so, so it's called the Signs of Life. Now close your eyes and try to stop being angry. Try to stop raging at all those who deserve your righteous fury. Close your eyes and allow yourself just for a moment to simply feel the pain, to hesitate, to be confused, to feel sorrow, remorse. You still have your whole life to spend pro- persecuting, avenging, reckoning, but for now, just close your eyes and look inward, like a satellite o- hovering over a disaster zone, searching for signs of life. A lot has been taken away from you, but you're still a human being. Wounded, bloodied, angry, hurting, frightened, drowning in sorrow, but still human. Take a deep breath and try to remember the feeling, because you know that a minute from now, when you open your eyes again, it will be gone. Thank you for for that. Um, I'm going to pivot a little and ask you uh, about uh, the last post you put on, on your newsletter on Alphabet Soup. And you mentioned uh, your mother and how now even more. Um, and you said a little bit about your father. But can you say maybe a few words because uh, and how? Um, about my mom? Yeah. Yeah. So my, my mother, my mother was a... a a child of war. She was in the Warsaw Ghetto. Basically, she lost all her family. Her mother and and her brother were murdered in front of her eyes when she was very young. And by the end of the war, there, there was nobody that she knew before the war that was still alive, which meant that all her personal history, all her story, all her biography was something that she could only rely on herself, you know, as a five, six, seven years old child, which meant that when she was 80 and we visited Poland, I, we discovered for the first time that she's been celebrating her birthday since childhood in a date that was totally wrong. We we celebrated on the 21st of November. She was born on the 4th of January. But she was alone in this world and she thought somebody told her she heard so this was reality for her and i think that there was something about my mom that because she she was a child who kind of never grew up you know because usually you rebel against your parents or something but with her there was no a parental authority anywhere nobody cared for her so she was just there, like, you know, like kind of a Lord of the Flies kind of existence, you know. And it made made her take all those kind of childlike things, like this feeling of omnipotence, this idea that you go all the way, all in on everything, that you don't give up on your passions. You know, this kind of persistence that sometimes you only see with five years old, then it stayed with her. And uh, she was really the most amazing person I've ever met I I've uh, made oh I didn't make Ira Glass made a show about her hosting me in this American life uh, uh, basically it's called half-baked stories about my dead mother and uh, really if anyone wants to listen to it it's really she she was an amazing person and a very funny one yeah we'll we'll make sure to to send it in the follow-up email um, can you say something about what you're working on right now? Is it the book that didn't go to the publisher or is there something new? Uh, so I've, I've uh, finished 
the books that didn't go to publisher, but I still have to read it and kind of re-edit it and stuff. Uh, but the things that I'm working on is a longer story, uh, which take place uh, in hell, kind of. A kind of hell, you know, it's disputable, but it's very kind of an afterlife story. Very... Very fitting, you know, what's going on right now. It's not, it's not, it, I think it's hopeful. I, all the stuff that I write in the end is hopeful. I think the point that I write it is to find hope. But, uh, but sometimes it's just funny, hopeful, and this one is horrible, hopeful. And, um, and this is fiction too. Yeah. Yeah. You had one book that, uh, that wasn't fiction, the the good seven years. Uh, is that something you're you think you'd find yourself doing again, or that was uh, 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 one so, time thing, and you're back to fiction? So the the thing is, I think that f fiction and nonfiction they have two functions, two different functions in my life. And I think that uh, that I told you about fiction. The thing that I like about fiction is that I don't know what I'm going to write. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if somebody holds a gun at my character. I don't know if he's going to shoot him or not. You know, some say, some someone does, but it's not me. You know, and the thing is, when you write nonfiction, there is something that is less excited, exciting in the fact that you're retelling a story. So, so. On the face of it, you know, you don't even have this kind of vanity saying, "Oh, I made it up." You know, I have, I, I have amazing nonfiction stories. But if somebody tells me it's an amazing story, I say, "Yeah, but I don't deserve credit." You know, thank God for making my life so weird. But, but, but this doesn't mean so. So I think that naturally I always go to the to the fiction. But there is something about nonfiction that it's a very good process uh, for you to understand. The reality that you've lived because I feel that when I live thing, I'm always in the situation, you know. So if I fight with you and I say, Oh, come on, you with your dumb examples, etc., and we I argue. But when I write a story, I'm not in my point of view. I see both of us. And many times when I write stories, nonfiction texts, it helps me. To understand how why people did what they did, uh, to uh, uh, to forgive people for things, to later apologize because I understand that what I did was wrong. So, to, uh, so I think that you know there is something. If I take a kind of a my personal image of it, then let's say I think that uh, that fiction writing is like a a. a diving from a high rock into an ocean and the uh, writing down fiction feels to me more like uh, before you go out you look in the mirror to see that you don't have parsley in your teeth you know so so i think people should do both but i'm more attracted into jumping off rocks um for uh, I'm just thinking that the story you told about your sister kind of is a good example for how uh, you see uh, nonfiction and uh, and how it helps you see see the reality. Um, from the different projects you did, like because you film in theater and that aren't writing, is there one that is especially dear to your heart? That uh... Uh, I think that uh, I I I. I wrote, co-wrote, and co-directed with my wife a, a mini series uh, for Arte TV uh, called The Middleman. Uh, I think a, a, it's for the French TV, yeah. For French TV, yeah, it's fe featuring uh, Mathieu Amalric. He's a, he's an amazing actor. I think it was even shown in the in the US, but in a very small challenge of a uh, channel that. Criterion channel or something like that, but uh, I there was something ab about this process. I, I tell you what was really really amazing about this is that I I told you that you know that I write a story I really don't know what the story is trying to tell me, but then I can look and I understand. So when we worked on this project, we worked on this project for four years, four years, and basically you know without giving any spoilers, 
it's a story about a person who discovers that he can move in time and the and his mother is dead and basically when he moves in time in the end I don't know he's able to meet his mother I don't want to to tell too many things but this is so when I've edited I sound edited the last scene where he meets his mother I see I have a 50 calls from my brother that I didn't notice and then I answer him and he said mother has a terminal cancer the doctor says that she won't have more than four months to live and I said to my brother I was in Belgium I said to him I'm going to finish this in four hours I'm going to get on a plane and I'll be home and then I get into the room and I didn't even tell the editor you know because I, I wanted to stay focused and I, I didn't want people feeling sorry for me and I said, and I said, okay, show me the scene again. And I see the scene again. And I realize that this entire series is basically about my fear of losing my mother. That all this story about a person going... Now, I sold this series to a TV channel, explaining to them what it is, it's all about, telling them something that was wrong, but that I believe at the time was true. But then at this moment, getting this phone call, I say... That's the thing, you know, it's about somebody who wants to hug his mother for the last time because he knows he won't be able to hug her anymore. And for four years, I, I'm scared, but only now it interrupted. So there was something about this, this process that it was really kind of like an epiphany and also the challenge of uh, directing in a language that we don't speak, you know, so... It was a very, very interesting and exciting process. Um, well, now I have like more questions in very little time. Uh, so just one that kind of came out from what you said now um, and about translation or the carrying over between languages because so much of what you uh, write about is extremely local. Uh, and rooted within Israeli culture. Can you say something about how you experience its translation, both maybe to English and American culture, and then to cultures uh, where you don't speak the language? Yeah, so first first I want to say that I'm lucky enough that uh, all my translators to English, uh, you know, the late Miriam Schlesinger and Sandra Silverstone and Jessica Cohen, uh, they're all people that I felt, you know, when we were working, that uh, that we were friends, you know, it wasn't really like kind of a professional process. It was really like I've yet to work with a translator that wouldn't feel free to say, yeah, I tra translated it, uh, but I actually think it sucks. You know, they, they could say that to me because we, we were cl close enough, you know, or I didn't get the end or I don't know, it's ridiculous or something like that. So uh, now... Uh, this, my stories, you know, they, they've been translated to more than 50 languages and I don't speak any of them. When my parents were alive, they spoke many languages. They would check translations and my mother, you know, till her last day, she she always uh, claimed that the, the Polish translation of my stories was much better than the Hebrew original. And, uh, and she would always say like, you only think you're an Israeli writer. You're actually a Polish writer in exile. Oh. And the, uh, and the, uh, but but what I wanted to say is that when it comes to English, and I speak English, you know, to some degree, I can't. I, I'm not very fluent in English, but I can understand some. That it it I I it we I always notice in translation how languages are extremely different. And how basically the role of the translator is not to, let's say, if the story is liquid and it's in a cup written Hebrew on it, to split it to a cup written English on it, but basically to rewrite it, you know. And, you know, and I can give you both like linguistic examples or cultural examples. What, what do you prefer, a linguistic or a cultural one? Both. Both. Okay. <laughs> so. Gonna go a few minutes over time. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So, so the linguistic one, I have many, but I, I give you one. I have a story about a, a guy who's a real estate agent. And then one day, this woman comes to him. She looks very emotional. And she said that she discovered that her husband was cheating on her. And that she wants to, an apartment for herself. 
And as they start going through the apartments, the real estate agent realizes that she didn't pick him randomly. She picked him because he's the one who rented the, the love nest to her husband. So basically she's looking for an apartment, but she's also trying to find some information about her husband's young lover. So at some stage when they drive between apartment, the guy says to her, in, she says to the man in, in Hebrew, he afa, which means, is she beautiful? Now in Hebrew, we don't have an it form. So everything, every object, the glass, the table, the chair is either she or he. So when she says to him, is she beautiful? He says, not only is she beautiful, but you'll have your own parking because an apartment is feminine. And this guy, he doesn't want to get into this mess of this family. He wants to sell this apartment. So he takes advantage of the fact that he can misunderstand her question about the woman as a question about an apartment. Now, you can't translate it. You can only basically rewrite it. You, you can create another misunderstanding. And this is one example about, you know, it's like, even like, you know, I mean, words like a mind, you know, you don't have a word for mind in Hebrew. And there are words in Hebrew that you don't have the exact word for in English. And when it comes to cultural things, then I have this story that is called the, the bus driver who wanted to be God. And uh, in this story, there is a, a guy who runs after a bus. And in the story, it's, it's, it, it, it says that all his wheezing, and in Hebrew it was his noblest cigarettes wheezing, because noblest is the name of a brand of cigarettes. So when Miriam, the late Miriam had translated this story, she said, there is no noblest cigarette. It's an Israeli cigarette in the States, so I'm going to pick an American cigarette. A, a random one. And they said, no, no, it can be random. And she said to me, why? And I said, because the Nobel cigarette is a very special cigarette. It's a cigarette that you can get in kibbutzes for free. So usually people who smoke Nobel, it means that they're either just anti-capitalists, you know, socialists or something, or most chances that they are underachievers because it's a cheap cigarette that everybody can get, you know. So you'll never see a Wall Street broker guy, you know, an investment banker smoking noblesse, you know. So it's the cigarette of the underachiever. And she said, you know, in the US, I know many cigarettes, but I don't think that they brand cigarettes for underachievers, you know. So we, we, we picked Lucky Strike because it sounded nice. But then my, the same story was a, a translated to all kinds of Eastern former communist countries. And the moment that he said to them, cigarette of the underachievers said, oh yeah, I know this cigarette. Without a filter, only two slotty. Yeah, I know those. Yeah, you, when you see somebody smoke this cigarette, you say, oh my God, this guy doesn't have money for a bus, you know? So, so it's funny how some of those asso associations travel to better to some places and really don't do not exist in others. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to end with a question and go out on a limb here because it seemed to work for some people uh, according to your story. And to end, I will ask you to tell us all what to do. Well, uh, you, you know, I, I, I think that the, one of the, the things that the, I, I think I quoted is that my mom told me, you know, that she said, uh, we know, when things are good, you can lean on everything. When things are bad, you can lean on yourself. I really, I think that what really happening is that a, our meeting with the word is very fake. It's like I'm saying, let's say if you were a Jew now living anywhere in the world, you really, really feel haunted and attacked. And you hear about this poor person who demonstrated in Los Angeles and got killed. And you... You hear people saying uh, from the river to the sea and all those kind of things. But actually, we are living through social media and media in general uh, with the tools that kind of amplifies strongly certain things and doesn't let other things come through. You know, if 
somebody who, if Kanye West says, I love Hitler, then it becomes viral. If he would say, I love strawberries, nobody would know about that. You know, so, so I'm saying it's kind of a rigged game. And the, in this rigged game, it, it's, it, we feel intimidated and helpless. But basically, you know, even when our feed is full of all kinds of thoughts that are hateful, the majority of people do not think that, you know. So my advice is really stay clear of social media. Don't see too much TV. Choose what you want to watch and read. And if after two sentences you say, well, actually, I don't want to watch it or I don't want to read it, you don't have to read it. And it also kind of a, a break out from this illusion that you need to absorb all this information to live your life or to survive. In a sense, I think we went through some kind of transformations at the time that we used for seeing movies, going to the theater, listening to classical music, because of our shorter attention span, because of the world is in such a turmoil, we traded it for something that is not pleasant and that it makes us feel insecure and depressed. And we should go back to the old ways, really. Less Facebook, less Instagram, less Fox News and CNN. More listening to songs that you like, more spending time with people that you like, because this is really, it's not as if you're blocking reality. Reality is out there. Nobody said that it should sit with its dirty, muddy shoes, you know, in your living room. It can stay out there. You can visit it. You can chase it away if it gets too close. But really, you can do better than what the world is offering. Thank you very, very much. Um, you see, you do know what to do. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and uh, as part of not listening to news but doing other stuff, you're more than welcome to join more and more of uh, CSP programs, which allow us to come together around uh, uh, thinking and learning and meeting new people. Uh, Edgar, thank you very, very much. Thank you so much. It was uh, great speaking to you. Like, I mean, thank all the other people who are listening, but it was really, really like, I'm, I must say I go through months of uh, interviews and I'm usually like, I either feel attacked or bored, you know, but, but, it, <laughs> but it, it really felt like I'm, I was talking to an old time friend, you know, so thank you for that. Thank you very much. Well, an old time fan. So, uh, <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day, afternoon, evening or night, wherever you are. Go do something fun. Bye.